and then just don't be afraid to project. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Until we get a mic, don't be afraid to project. Ask my wife if that's ever been a problem. No, there's no problem on that one. My outdoor voice is softer than my indoor voice. So, so tell me if I need to use my uh, indoor voice. Yeah, there was one late, one church that we went to and they mic'd him. And after about two minutes into the sermon, the lady went in and turned him off. <laughs> She did that mentally a couple minutes before that. <laughs> you were just so loud, it was deafening. Well, it's kind of where it's normal. at. Yeah. yeah, that's just your normal totally you. Totally. I'm also going to try to make sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess you don't want your ringtone going off. Yeah, exactly. Well, oh, that might be fun. Yeah. <laughs> God's calling. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, is this God? <laughs> contact that they want to join that next week? Um, I would say Tim's the one that's spearheading Tim, that. okay. We want, and okay. Anybody's welcome to join, but we're going to get a series. I mean, it's well, that's okay. Sense. It's better than nothing. Yeah, well, I, I said I struggled <laughs> well, last week to come up with something mm -hmm. that I could watch. I tried to watch yeah. the Catholic Hour, and that, that didn't happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't mean to put it down yeah. since there is so much liturgy and not enough yeah. meat, but I, I can't Well, good morning to all of you folks here from Christ United Methodist Church in Baltimore, Ohio, or as my Uncle Joe, who used to live here, would call it Baltimore. I don't know if anyone here ever calls it Baltimore or not. I'm looking at some people here. Anybody ever call it Baltimore? It must have just been his way of calling it. Okay, yeah, my Uncle Joe and Aunt May used to live in Baltimore. And in fact, on the way in here, we were saying, I wonder if that cemetery is where they're buried or not. Uh, and in fact, one of the older ladies in the... Uh, I digress here. One of the older ladies in the church a few weeks ago said she uh, knew my uncle and aunt. Uh, they had joined this church late in life because that had merged with some other church that they were in or something. Anyway, let's get back to business here. Uh, welcome, I'm Brian Straub. I am uh, subbing for Pastor Steve as he continues his recovery. Of course, we're all praying for Pastor Steve every day. And uh, Steve, we're praying for you and hope things are going well for you and that you're getting stronger and that you'll be back here in the church building very soon. We're live streaming this message today on Facebook. So hopefully I heard uh, at least six of you have logged on and are watching this. In addition, and later on today, this will be posted on the church's Facebook page. Uh, so if you uh, have friends who missed it today and they want to see the message uh, and hear it, 
uh, let them know later on today. It'll be on your Facebook page, or I guess you can go to the church webpage, and there will be a link there to uh, get to where you can watch this on the Facebook as well. Uh, today we're live streaming. As I said, that means you get to see me as well as hear me. That may be a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not real sure. Uh, but anyway, we're doing this today because we're in our second week of canceled services due to the spread of the coronavirus. Uh, and really, this is a huge once-in-a-lifetime event for us. I've never been through anything like this in my life. The other, worst thing I've been through before this was the blizzard of 78, uh, where we were snowed into our house for, uh, what, four or five days or so, and couldn't even get out of the house. Uh, but this uh, is certainly a serious time for us all in our country as well as around the world. And this demands our serious prayer time as well. So I'd for, like for us to bow our heads for a time of prayer right now. Heavenly Father, the world is certainly different from the way it was just a few short weeks ago. Last month, the coronavirus was just some disease in China. Now it has spread around the world and affected nearly everyone. There are almost 27,000 confirmed cases in our country alone and 354 Americans have died because of it. And around the world, over 320,000 have been infected, and over 13,000 have died. Those of us who have not contracted the virus see our lives totally changed. Activities, even worship services, are canceled. Necessary supplies for living have become, in some cases, scarce and hard to get. And as we stay self-quarantined in our homes, we fear what may happen to the world as a result of this virus. We continue to pray for all those who have been infected by this virus all around the world. We pray for you to reach out with your healing touch, to relieve the suffering and to cure those who are now ill. We ask you to strengthen and comfort those families around the world who are grieving the loss of a loved one, who have died because of this virus. Please continue to guide and bless all those who are working to help us through this situation, the doctors and nurses that are helping those who are sick, the labs that are making test kits and working for a vaccine or a cure for this virus, our president and vice president and governor, the World Health Organization, and the Center for Disease Control. God, we pray for your peace to come and rest upon all of us. We can have this peace because we know that you hold the world in your hands. You are here to help us and strengthen us through the difficult times of life. And this is certainly one of the most difficult. And we know we can trust in you because you love us so much that you gave your son on the cross to die for our salvation. Certainly that proves your love and that we can place our trust in you. So we pray for your Holy Spirit to rest upon us and within us, to strengthen us and to fill us with all the fruit of the Spirit. Please grant these mercies in the name of the great physician and our Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to come to you praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, as I said, we're canceled right now. How many more weeks will we be canceled? Well, who knows? I know uh, they are asking us to cancel through Easter Sunday right now. That means at least a few more weeks we're going to be meeting here, uh, live streaming on Facebook. Uh, how long will this last? Well, I checked my crystal ball today. Unfortunately, my crystal ball is always very cloudy, and I'm sure there's an on-off switch on it, and it's usually on-off. So I have always been really lousy at predicting the future. But just because we have to stay in our homes doesn't mean we can't meet together, and it doesn't mean we have to remain isolated. I mean, you still have your phones and your computers. So while we go through this time, I want to ask you folks here at Christ United Methodist Church to do several things. The first thing is this. I want to encourage those of you who are spiritual leaders, and you know who you are. I'm sure you do. 
to use these, these tools of communication, your phone and your commu uh, computer, to communicate with your flock. Sunday school teachers, uh, I know there was a Sunday school class online today at 9 o'clock. And there were 14 people logged on for a Sunday school class. Now, if you're not a part of that class, doesn't matter. Uh, if you want to log on for Sunday school at 9 o'clock, and I encourage all of you to do that, uh, contact Tim Lawless, send an email to Tim or to the church office, and we'll get instructions to you on how to uh, be able to participate in that. In addition, if you are a spiritual leader, if you're a Sunday school teacher, or a, I don't know if you have small groups in the church uh, that meet during the week, uh, or if you're a, maybe a, a leader of some other group, a committee or whatever it is, uh, communicate with your people that you lead during this coming week. Uh, call them on the phone. Uh, if, you know, if you're a Sunday school teacher, how about spending the week each evening calling a few of the people in your class and talking to them on the phone to give them some words of encouragement and certainly to pray with them over the phone. If you're a children's class teacher or a youth class teacher, call your children this week or the youth just to talk to them and to pray with them over the phone. Uh, you know, one of the things I never say to other people is, I will pray for you. You know, I never say that to people. Instead of that, what I always say is, can I pray with you now? People, I think, would rather be prayed with than prayed for. So when you call somebody on the phone, uh, what you might want to say is, uh, before we hang up, can I have a prayer with you right now? And this give them a short two or three sentence prayer and amen, and then say, okay, good talking to you. Uh, I'll talk to you later. Uh, if I know there are a lot of shut-ins within the church. Uh, every church has a bunch of shut-ins, people who are under self-isolation, even in times when we don't have a pandemic. Maybe some of you who have that burden on your heart to contact them might want to call your shut-ins from the church this week. And again, just say, hey, I'm calling to check up uh, on you and uh, see how you're doing. Is everything okay? And before I hang up, I'd like to pray with you. I bet they would love that. And so uh, I'm encouraging those of you who are spiritual leaders here to get involved in telephone ministry. Here's the second thing I'm going to ask you to do this week. You know, all of us Christians can use this time as a great opportunity to witness for Jesus Christ. Just uh, as, you, as you talk to people, just throw an occasional sentence into your con conversation that expresses your faith. You might say something like, well, I'm not afraid of this because I know my God is watching over me. That might really be a word of encouragement to somebody who's feeling some fear over what the future may hold for them. Or you might say something like, well, if I get the coronavirus, it just means Jesus will, might take me home to heaven a few days earlier, so I'm good with that. I'm not afraid. That is words of encouragement that might make people think a little bit. Well, do I have that kind of faith? Do I need to develop that kind of faith like he or she has? So use this as a time of witness. Uh, because people, I think, are anxious to find people who have strength to lead them. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Or how about this? How about sitting down at your computer this afternoon and writing a brief testimony about how God is blessing you through this time and then emailing it to all of your friends? And at the course of the bottom of that email, you'll want to include a prayer, just a brief, as I said, two or three sentence prayer where you lift up all of your friends and ask God to bless them the way he's blessing you. What a great opportunity we have to witness to others right now because of this pandemic that we're going through. And I think the world is hungry for the witness that only we can give to them. Here's the third thing I want to encourage you to do as we go through this time, and that is remember your church's financial expenses continue even when you aren't here in the building. Regardless if you're not here because of self-isolation or you're off uh, on vacation in the summer, the church's expenses continue. Salaries and utilities and other expenses all continue need to be paid. So if you make your offering through electronic means, and I know some of you here do that, maybe you do it, uh, maybe you have each month log on and make a contribution or maybe you have direct withdrawal, uh, if you use some form of electronic giving, then you're good. You can continue just doing what you're doing. If you usually put something in the offering plate on Sunday mornings, I want to encourage you to take a minute this week and write a check and mail it in. 
because the church is going to continue to pay its bills even when you aren't here. And let me tell you this. This is something your finance committee stresses over. I've been a pastor for over 40 years, and I've never known a finance committee that didn't deal with stress and anxiety when there was a time like this where people had to miss church, and oftentimes people then miss putting in their contribution. So uh, please feel free to continue your faithful stewardship to the church. Now, if you find your income is drastically reduced, maybe you've been laid off from work. Maybe you're like a waitress or, or a hairdresser or a barber or something like that where your business is now closed. Uh, if you find your incomes have been reduced due to being laid off, that will certainly affect what you give to God. That's one of the great parts of the wisdom of proportional giving. I am sure your pastors in the past have talked to you and taught you about proportional giving, where you give a percentage of your income. And of course, the goal, of course, which the Bible teaches, is to tithe, to give a 10% of your income back to God each uh, week or month. But, uh, you know, if you're giving proportionally and your income goes down, then what you give back to God automatically goes down because you maintain a percentage. And likewise, there might be times when your income goes up and that's when you, what you give back to God goes up because you're giving a percentage, you're giving proportionally. So please keep that in mind. Pray about what you need to do uh, to support your church financially during this time and act according to how God leads you. Okay, right now I want you to get your Bibles, get everybody in the family together, if there's other people in your house with you. Uh, you should have three things in front of you. One is your Bible, and you're going to open that to Ephesians chapter 4. Earlier this week, we emailed out the sermon notes. Now, if you don't have email, or if you haven't found those yet, if it's in your uh, junk mail, then just get a blank sheet of paper, and I'll show you what to write down. I'll tell you what to write down as we go through this. And, of course, get a pen or a pencil, and uh, you can take notes as we go through Ephesians 4, and then refer back to that each day as you read your Bible. Leave the notes in your Bible and read through those notes each day when you read your Bible. Uh, and we'll talk about reading your Bible in a little bit here this morning. Now, last week I gave you homework. Do you remember what your homework was? Of course you do because you wrote it down in your sermon notes. Your homework was to pray every day, God, may your power be at work within me. God, may your power be at work within me. How did that go for you? I hope that went well for you, and in fact, that might be something you write in an email. Uh, you know, last week I prayed every day according to how uh, Pastor Brian told me to pray, God, may your power be at work with me, and this is how I experienced God's power. What a great testimony. What a great testimony, if you think it's some minor way that that took place. Still, write it down in an email and send it out to your friends, uh, and that will be great. Okay, let's start with verses 1 through 10 in Ephesians chapter 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. That is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens, in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. I read there verses 1 through 13. The version I read is NIV. You might have a different version, but that's fine. It doesn't matter as long as you're reading your Bible. Note how this starts off. Again, Paul starts off with the words, as a prisoner for the Lord. As a prisoner for the Lord. Paul again calls attention, as he did the last couple chapters, to being in chains. And we talked about that 
last week. Now for us, we may feel like we're prisoners right now too. You may feel like you're under house arrest. And in a way, we are under house arrest, aren't we? We have to stay in our homes even when we don't want to. But remember what Paul is saying here. He is a prisoner for the Lord. And that for Paul makes all the difference in the world. Now what's important here is that he is setting an example. Because by being in chains, Paul is different from everyone else. I am sure when he was being led from the dock of, of the ship in Rome, at the port, into the prison where he was going to be imprisoned in Rome, the uh, soldiers would have led a procession of all the prisoners in chains through the streets of Rome to get them to the prison. And I'll bet as they were holding that parade of prisoners through the streets, all the people stopped and stared at the prisoners. I'll bet Paul loved that because he knew this was an opportunity for him to be a witness for Christ. And here's what I think the first chapter, uh, first part of the chapter four is saying to us. Write this down on your sermon notes. Your faith is reflected in your life. Your faith is reflected in your life. In other words, Christians should be different from everyone else. A few years ago, a few years ago for an old guy like me, means me maybe 25 or 30 years ago, Stanley Hauerwas and William Willimon wrote a book called Resident Aliens. And what the whole gist of their book was is that we are not to be like the rest of the people on earth. We're not supposed to, as Christians, to blend in with other people any more than people from outer space would be able to blend in from with other people or more to be like let's think of Mr. Spock on Star Trek or E.T. or some of the aliens in Men in Black or Elf. Elf is I think my favorite alien. Uh, you know if Elf were to walk in this room right now people would immediately look at Elf and say he's not normal. He's not of this world, is he? He's strange, there's something different about that guy. We're called to be different from everyone else too, and that's the whole focus of chapter four in Ephesians. In other words, we are called to be resident aliens. In fact, I've often said, if I were making a Christian movie, let's say we're making a movie of Paul, and Paul's life, which there was one that came out in the theaters a few years ago. Excellent movie, by the way. Maybe it's available on DVD. I don't know. Uh, but if I were making a movie of Paul, do you know who I would get to play the role of Paul? Chewbacca. You know Chewbacca on the Star Wars movies? Where he goes around and goes, Aah! And people look at him and say, he's strange. He's not like us. That's Paul. Paul is strange. He doesn't want to be like everybody else. He wants to be different. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 11. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. Okay, we're to be aliens and strangers on earth. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter wrote, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world, to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good deeds among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Okay, now how do aliens live? How do Christian aliens live in the world? Let's go back to verse 2 in your Bible. Look at verse 2. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Underline verse 2 in your Bible, okay? That is a key verse in this book. Underline verse 2. And when you get to the word completely, circle that word. Because that is the key word in the uh, verse number 2. This is probably the most important part of Ephesians. And this is probably the biggest problem most Christians have today. Most Christians, we have to admit, don't want to be completely like Christ. You know, if we have to be honest, let's be honest. Most Christians don't want to be completely like Christ. Oh, we want to be Christ like Christ maybe a little bit, but completely? Uh, that would mean some major changes in my life. Major changes in what I do and what I say 
and what I think. And so many Christians don't want to be completely Christ-centered in everything they think, say, and do. Because that means we have to change. And that is why, and i got to be blunt here, that is why so many Methodist churches and other churches of other denominations that I visit are stuck in a stage of mediocrity and the church is weak and ineffective because it's filled with Christians who want to be a little bit like Christ, but they don't want to be completely like Christ. Now, if you found a person who was completely all those things in verse 2, and remember, the Bible uses the one that used the word completely. That's not my word. That person would be really strange. They would be different from everybody else. Now, there's a theological word that describes this being different from everybody else and being like Christ. And that word is sanctification. That's a long word, isn't it? But a sanctified person is truly different from everyone else. That's the next thing to write on your sermon notes. A sanctified person is truly different from everyone else. Listen to what it says in John 17. They are not of the world, Jesus says, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Jesus is praying. You know, John 17 is a prayer, which Jesus prays for his disciples. And think about this. When you read John 17, he's praying for you specifically in that prayer as well. And he is praying for us to be sanctified, to be completely like him. Let me read those verses again in a different version. That was, the first one was NIV. This is New Living Translation. This is how this puts it. They are not a part of this world any more than I am. Make them pure and holy by teaching them your words of truth. As, I, as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself entirely to you so they also might be entirely yours. Christ doesn't want us to be a little bit belonging to God. He wants us to be entirely belonging to God. So how does one live the faith? How does one become an alien in the world? How does one become sanctified? Well, luckily, Paul tells us. There are three ways he tells us in the rest of Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to pick up Ephesians 4 now and read verses 11 to 16. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. This includes in it the first way to really grow to be sanctified, to grow to become completely like Christ. The first way is this. Follow godly leaders for your spiritual growth. Follow godly leaders for your spiritual growth. God gives us apostles, a prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That's also mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul goes through the gifts of the Spirit. Why does he give us those people? Verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That is our number one goal. So how do you become a mature Christian? How do you get the whole measure? By following the example of other mature Christians. Here's what we read in Hebrews 13. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. In Hebrews 13 verse 17 it says, Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they know they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this joyfully and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. 
Think of Pastor Steve when I read that verse. Read that verse over again. Think of Pastor Steve. If you want to give Pastor Steve cause for joy, then you need to follow his uh, leadership and actually do what he encourages you to do because he knows. He's a mature Christian. He knows what you need to do to become sanctified and to become truly uh, have the fullness of Christ. Now, in order to do all this, of course, that means you need to participate in the life of your church. You need to participate in the life of your church. You're doing that right now. If you're listening to this right now, good for you. If you're listening to this not right now, but later this afternoon or tomorrow or Tuesday or sometime, good for you. You're participating in the life of your church. Once we get back to where we're meeting again together, then you need to, again, attend worship every week. You need to get involved in a Sunday school class in small group. I imagine you can do that on Sundays at 9 now. Or uh, if you're not in a class, you need to join one. Or if you don't have one here you like, start one. Talk to Steve when he gets back and say, Hey, Steve, I want to start a group, a uh, Bible study group, that meets on Sunday mornings. Can we have another room? Or I want to start one that meets in my home on Tuesday evenings at 7. Can you give us some material to study? What leadership can you give us as we start a new group? Let me tell you, I, and, and I've not talked to Steve about this, but I know Steve. Steve would love to hear you say that to him. He would love to have you all in a class or a small group, as well as attending worship. I've always taught my people, I went through my ministry, that God wanted two hours from them on Sunday morning, one in worship and one in a Sunday school class, or if not in a class on Sunday morning, in a small group sometime during the week. Then when you do that, do what God says to do through your godly leaders. Remember, Hebrews 13, 17 says, this is for your benefit. You're not doing this just for others, although others will benefit from your, for, from your participation. This is for your benefit as well. If your godly leader is truly godly, he will not lead you astray. He will lead you in the right direction. Now, I know there are many godly leaders in this church. We are so blessed here to have an abundance of them. You know who they are, too. Right now, I bet you have pictured in your mind one or two people in this church that you're thinking, yeah, that is certainly a godly leader in Christ United Methodist Church. But do you take advantage of them? So when they speak the truth in love, which is again in Ephesians 4, when they gently rebuke you and guide you, do you submit to their leadership? If you don't do that, if you don't submit to your religious and spiritual leader's leadership, there is another word in the Bible that describes those people who don't do that. I talked about that a few weeks ago. There's a theological term. That term is fool. Think of fool as a theological word. Here's what we read in Proverbs 12, 15. The way of a fool seems right to him, but a wise man listens to advice. Proverbs 23, 9. Don't waste your breath on fools, for they will despise the wisest advice. Proverbs 19.20, listen to the advice and accept instruction, and in the end, you will be wise. Proverbs 12.15, fools think they need no advice, but the wise listen to others. And Proverbs 13.13, 13, people who despise advice will find themselves in trouble. Those who respect it will succeed. So what you need to do is to look for people who can give you wise spiritual advice, and we all need those people in our lives. I do too. Look for those people and follow the advice they give you. That's the first way we grow to be completely like Christ. Let's move on to verses 17 through 32. Okay, this is the rest of the chapter. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the love of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self-created, new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. 
In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Here's the second way Paul is telling us we can be sanctified, we can be completely like Christ. Avoid sinful practices. Write that down. Avoid sinful practices. And Paul makes a short list. This is just a short list of what the ways of the world are. In verse 9, he talks about sensuality, to indulge in every kind of impurity. That's a big category right there. That covers things like taking drugs, drunkenness, sex outside of marriage, visiting bad internet sites, spending too much time on the computer, even on good internet sites. You know, the internet can be a huge waste of time for a lot of us. How many people do I hear say, I don't have time to read my Bible, but they can spend five hours on the internet, okay? Using the internet too much can be a bad practice uh, when they should be doing something more pleasing to God. So we need to avoid sensuality to indulge in things which do not lift us up. Verse 25 put, says, put off falsehood. Don't ever lie, ever. Verse 26, don't sin when you get angry. Now notice it doesn't say don't get angry. The Bible never says don't get angry. In fact, we read in the Bible, God gets angry sometimes. It's okay to get angry, just hold your tongue and don't say anything you will regret later. Do not sin when you're angry. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 5. You're familiar with the command of the ancients, do not murder. I'm telling you that anyone who is so much as angry with a brother or sister is guilty of murder. Carelessly call a brother idiot and you just might find yourself hauled into court. Thoughtlessly yell stupid at a sister and you're on the brink of hellfire. The simple moral fact is that words kill. When you're angry, watch your words. Proverbs 29, 11 says, A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. In James 1, James wrote, My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous light that God desires. And Proverbs 14, 29, Those who control their anger have great understanding. Those with hasty temper will make mistakes. So watch what you say. When you're angry, when you're not angry, watch what you say. Verse 28 says, don't steal. I'm guessing most of you here are not thieves, okay? You're not going out and robbing the liquor store tonight. Good for you. But it also says work and share with others. Work and share with others. What's the difference? One way is selfish. The other way is selfless. Paul tells the leaders in the church in Ephesus in Acts 20, and I have been a constant example to you how you can help the poor by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus is more blessed to give than to receive. That's the gist of what verse 28 is telling us. In verse 29, Paul again brings up unwholesome talk as compared to talks that builds others up. Ephesians 4.29, do not use foul or abusive language. This is New Living Translation. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, therefore encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Acts 15.32, Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the brothers. Now this is not the same Judas as the Judas that betrayed him. This is another Judas. Uh, and it's, but let me tell you, it's much better to be known as Judas or Silas than a critical old geezer or nag. Okay, which reputation do you want? So watch what you say. In particular, people need encouragement. I mentioned this a little bit ago. People need encouragement as we go through this pandemic. Offer them words of encouragement. Verse 22 to 24 gives us the third way we grow to be completely like Christ. It says, go back a page. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, 
which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. In other words, here's the next thing we need to do if we want to become like Christ. Seek a new attitude in your mind. Write that down. Seek a new attitude in your mind. Allow God to transform the way you think, the way you use what's up here. Let God give you an attitude adjustment. In Romans 12, 2, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. A lot of people think, well, religion doesn't have anything to do with the brain. It's all in the heart. No, that's not true. Christ is not only in our hearts. He's in our minds as well because the minds lead us in what we should be doing. In fact, Colossians 3, 2 says, set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things. Now, how do you do that? How do you change your mind? A lot of us change our mind when we want to go one place, not the other. How do we change our mind permanently so it's like Christ? Let me say it, you do it in two words, spiritual disciplines, spiritual disciplines. That means you do things like read your Bible every day. Have I mentioned that before? Is there a reason why we're going through a whole book of the Bible for these six weeks? Because the Bible is powerful and gives the, has in it the ability for us to have the attitude of Christ and to change our minds. You should be reading your Bible every single day. Now, all of us miss a day or two during the week. That happens. But, but I was uh, listening to a webinar earlier this week. Tuesday afternoon, there was a webinar on, uh, online about discipleship, and I was watching that, and one of the little nuggets they share with us is this. Their studies have found that if you read your Bible four or more times a week, that makes a significant difference in your life. And they said significant difference. Your life will be different than if you're reading your Bible only three times or fewer times than that per week. You need to be in your Bibles every day, or at least just about every day. Now, if Bible reading is something new to you, let me tell you how to start reading your Bible. Don't start in the book of Genesis. Okay, some people say, well, I'm going to read the Bible, and I'm going to read it straight through from cover to cover. If you're new to the Bible, don't do that. Instead, because you'll get bogged down in Leviticus and Numbers. Let me tell you, I don't make it through Leviticus and Numbers. So, and when you get later on into some of the other books, it gets really dull for a while. Even I admit that. Instead, if you're new to this, start with the Gospels. How about reading one or two chapters of Matthew this week? Every day. You know, by next Sunday, you're up to verse, uh, or chapter 13 or 14. Maybe there's somebody you want to call on the phone and read that with them. Boy, what an encouragement that may be to one of your friends to say, hey, the pastor Sunday told me to start reading the Bible. I want to read a chapter a day. How about if we do this together over the phone? How about if I call you every day at 4 p.m. Or, or 7 p.m. or something like that, and we'll read the Bible together, at least most days. Okay, start with that and read through the, all four Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, at least twice before you go through any other part of the Bible. That might take you uh, several months to do that. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, so start reading the Bible every day. As I said, four times or more a week makes significant difference in your life. Here's something else you should be doing, of course, is praying. I've always encouraged my parishioners when I was pastoring churches to have a 15-minute time of prayer every day where you turn off the computer, turn off the TV, get by yourself, have a written prayer list, and pray down that prayer list every day. And, of course, there are a lot of people. I know you have prayer lists from the church. I'll see if we mail one, email one out this week. Uh, certainly, when you have a prayer list in the bulletin insert, I certainly hope you take that home and pray for those people every day. Uh, I know uh, my wife is really great at that. I'm not so good, but she is really great at that. But I have my prayer list as well. Uh, so you need to be praying every day. Another spiritual discipline is meditation. That's where you read something and just think about it a little bit. That's all meditation is. It's not this Eastern thing where you cross your legs and close your eyes and, and hold your hands out. That's not meditation for a Christian. Meditation for a Christian is where you just think about what you just read in the Bible. Uh, our district superintendent uh, during this time is putting out a daily devotional on the Capital Area South website. 
you might want to contact the Capital Area South. I think the website is casumc.org. Uh, I think that's it. And sign up for them to email you the daily devotional. And when you read through that, just stop for me. Don't just read it and say, okay, that's the email's done. Now I'll go to the next email. Stop and say, I'm going to give 60 seconds to think about that. What does that mean for me? Okay, do some meditation. And here's the thing, when you're tempted to do something on the bad list that we just talked about, replace it with a spiritual discipline. Here's what Colossians 3.13 says, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. This is bringing up what we just read in verse 32, where it says, Be kind, compassionate, and forgiving. Write that down. Be kind, compassionate, and forgiving. Why does that make us like Christ? Because that's the way Christ is with us. And that is the goal of every Christian. That's when we learn that we're really becoming close to being completely like Christ, when we are kind, compassionate, and forgiving. Luke 6.35, Jesus said, But love your enemies. Do good to them and love to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. We need to forgive everyone else, no matter what they may have done to us. After all, if Jesus Christ can forgive me and with all the things I've done in my life, then I need to be able to forgive others as well. Uh, Matthew 6, 14, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you for do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is pretty important, isn't it? Forgiving others. You might say, well, how can I do that? I just don't have it in my heart. I just still hurt over what they did to me. I just can't forgive them. Well, that's right. You don't have that in your heart. But if you can have Jesus Christ in your heart and in your mind, that will help you move towards being able to forgive them. After all, Philippians 4.13 is another one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, for I can do everything with the help of Christ who gives me the strength I need. Even forgive others who have wronged me. Even forgive others who have wronged me. And then, of course, after you forgive them, you continue to pray for that other person as well. Matthew 5, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, Love your enemies and love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You know, when Paul was being hauled in chains off of that boat in Rome and the, at the dock into the prison, do you know what he was doing? He was praying for the, prison, for the other prisoners, and he was praying for the guards as well. Even though they were uh, hurting him and keeping him in chains, he was praying for them. And then, of course, you treat them with love. 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. It's been a long time, a message here today, but Ephesians 4 is a huge chapter in the Bible. The biggest message of Ephesians 4 is this. Grow to be like Christ. You don't want to be an infant like it says in chapter 4. You want to grow to be in Christ. That is your number one life goal. Do everything you can to become mature. And in fact, as we go through this pandemic, as we kind of self-isolate ourselves, Maybe this ought to be the focus of your life now for the next several weeks. Growing to become like Christ. Because you got time now to do it. Because you aren't so busy running around doing errands the way we used to do them back before the pandemic. Do everything you can to become mature and attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Let's close this with prayer. Heavenly Father, we must confess our slowness to want to grow to become mature Christians who have become completely like Christ. We would rather stay stuck in our mediocre ways of life than actually do things that would make our lives so much better while building your kingdom in the world. Forgive us. Help us. Build us up into the image of Christ. Amen. May God bless you as you go through this week. We hope everything is going well for you. May the peace and the strength and the power of our Lord Jesus Christ be upon your minds and hearts and bodies and souls to bless you in every way over the next seven days. Amen.